Uh, so first I'll thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and uh, give these lectures. Uh, so the, t the title of my lectures uh, was Gravity and Entanglement. Um, and so the context of that is trying to understand gravity quantum mechanically. So this is the, the major challenge for theoretical physics for the last uh, several decades, uh, trying to understand gravity within the framework of quantum mechanics. And fortunately, by now, we have at least, uh, at least some examples uh, that where we think uh, we have some complete description of uh, theories of quantum gravity. Okay. And the examples that I'm talking about are in the ADS-CFT correspondence. Okay. So uh, I imagine that most of you have some familiarity with this. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention, uh, as we go along, I'll mention some of the things that I'll need. Uh, it won't be all that much. Okay. But the basic idea is that we can define certain theories of quantum gravity starting with non-gravitational quantum systems, just ordinary quantum systems um, on some fixed space-time backgrounds. Um, the simplest ones are actually just, they don't have any space at all. They're just quantum mechanics, matrix quantum mechanics models. Um, but mostly, I'll be talking about quantum field theories. So some, for example, uh, uh, conform, certain conformal field theories, um, on some fixed space-time background B. Okay, and this actually, it could be Minkowski space, or a sphere times time, or actually anything you want, uh, but it's fixed. Okay, so we consider different states of the CFT on this fixed background. And the idea is through this magical equivalence um, that uh, Maldacena uh, taught us about, then this theory somehow describes non-perturbatively completely um, a theory of quantum gravity for space times with uh, certain asymptotics okay, that are determined by this geometry B and the UV behavior of the field theory. Okay, so mostly I'm just going to be talking about ADS CFT where we're actually talking about a CFT. Okay, and in that case, the geometries that we're talking about the states of the quantum gravity theory that we're talking about are asymptotically anti de Sitter space times. And the boundary geometry of those is the same geometry that the CFT lives on. So let's just mention a few examples. Um, so maybe the most common uh, example would be to think about B to be equal to Minkowski space, okay. And then, for example, if we take the vacuum state of the field theory on Minkowski space, then this is supposed to describe in this dual picture uh, pure the, the state of the gravity theory has a space time which is pure ADS uh, space time. If I need to use a specific uh, metric for that, uh, I'll often use this pfefferman gram description. So I'll write down the metric. So there's some, there's some uh, dimensionful parameter that sets the curvature scale of this ADS space time. Uh, there's a coordinate z, which starts at 0 at the boundary and then increases as you go away from the boundary, and the metric for pure ADS space-time looks like, looks like this. Okay. But then you could consider some excited states. Okay, so I could, I, could add, um, I could add some excitation to the vacuum. And this would correspond to then not just pure ADS, but uh, perhaps pure ADS with some gravity waves in there. Um, I could do something which is a larger excitation. So for example, um, if I considered a thermal state, so now I think of my field theory at finite temperature. Um, so then 
There's lots of excitations. Um, it's understood that this would correspond to, again, an asymptotically ADS space time, but not pure ADS, actually a space time that includes a planar black hole. Okay, so, so at some value of z, we reach a horizon, and, uh, and, and then we have this black, black brain. Okay. Um, so incidentally, all of these, all of these excited space times, we could also describe at least close enough to the boundary uh, in this same gauge. Okay, so where we take z as some special radial coordinate, uh, and then the difference would be instead of just this Minkowski metric in the directions orthogonal to z, then we have some general metric. Um, okay, so this would, so the black brain would be some particular choice for this tensor, and uh, other geometries they would get corresponding to other states would correspond to other choices for that tensor. Uh, another example that will come up, oops. So uh, in understanding quantum gravity, one of the most interesting types of states that we, we would want to study would be black holes. Okay, so instead of, um, instead of considering the thermal state of a field theory on Minkowski space, we might consider the thermal state of a field theory on a sphere. Okay. And, uh, okay, so then it's, it's quite similar to this example, except that now we have spherical symmetry instead of planar symmetry, and you end up with a black hole um, in, uh, so, so you can have an asymptotically ADS space whose boundary is, is spherical, and if you look at the thermal state of the field theory on the sphere, then you get a black hole geometry uh, as, as the gravity side of that correspondence. Okay. So that was a lightning review of just roughly how ADS-CFT works. I mean, the important thing is that you have different states in the field theory. These correspond to different, different geometries on the gravity side. Um, and this is now, well, 18 years old. Um, but there are many big questions that I think we don't really uh, understand. So these, and these questions are, are what will motivate uh, many of the things that I'll talk about. So some of the questions uh, would be, well, why does this work at all? How is it that, how is it that we start by considering some, say, a field theory system and, okay, so I, I should mention, I think I mentioned that the field theories for which this works, they tend to have large numbers of degrees of freedom. So if, if there's a Lagrangian, uh, often it's some, some matrix uh, field theory, a, a UN gauge theory where n is very large. Um, or in, in one plus one dimensions, we would have a large central charge. Um, and often these are strongly coupled theories. Um, so they're, they're somewhat difficult to study, but somehow out of this strongly coupled dynamics of large numbers of degrees of freedom, um, there's some interpretation that emerges that's equivalent to a space-time geometry, a classical space-time geometry. And somehow from the dynamics of this field theory, um, you end up with the dynamics of gravity. So how and, and why does this work? How do you get, how does space-time emerge? How does gravity emerge? Um, one of the things that I probably should have, that you're surely familiar with, but I should mention, um, these space times are higher dimensional than, than these ones. So, so because that's the boundary of this space time, really an, an entire extra dimension has emerged from the physics. Um, and so the, the, uh, the recent work that I'm gonna be talking about um, is giving some answers to some of these questions. Uh, and it's quite surprising. So, there's various recent work that suggests that in order to understand how space-time emerges here and how gravity emerges, you actually have to think of, so even, the, even to understand just the classical level on this side, classical space-time and Einstein's equations, um, to understand that, it seems that you have to think about intrinsically quantum mechanical things 
on this side. And specifically, uh, what we are now seeing is that the structure of entanglement, so how different parts of this field theory system are entangled with each other, uh, that seems to be crucial for understanding the space-time structure, or the space-time geometry. And we'll also see that just various constraints on entanglement, things that quantum information theorists had uh, come up with in just understanding um, fundamental properties of quantum systems. So these constraints on entanglement seem to be fundamentally related to, um, to constraints on space-time. Um, or, in other words, the, the dynamics of space-time. Einstein's equations are sort of a constraint on what possible space-times you can have. Okay. Okay, so that's roughly an introduction. Um, I'm going to start by mentioning that all of this recent work, there were actually hints of it starting in the 1970s. Okay, so even before ADS-CFT. Um, there was this really interesting work in the 1970s where Jacob Beckenstein and then later Hawking and other people um, started to realize these connections between black hole physics and thermodynamics. Okay, so that's actually going to be in intimately related. All this recent work is, in a sense, a generalization of, of that. Um, Okay, so let me remind you of some basic statements there. The observation of Bekenstein was that if you consider black hole horizons, and you think about the area of those horizons, then the horizon area of these black holes actually has various properties that are quite similar to entropy in thermodynamic systems. Okay, so specifically this combination, um, black hole horizon area over 4G Newton. The 4G Newton is for some, some quantitative um, reasons, but to get something dimensionless, so the horizon area has the same dimensions as G Newton. And so to get something that with the dimensions of entropy, then we have this ratio, and the four is for some, uh, some detailed quantitative agreement. So the idea is, uh, if you look at this quantity in the context of dynamical gravity, then it obeys various relationships very similar to um, laws of thermodynamics. Very similar to how entropy appears in laws of thermodynamics. So there's a first law that says if you, if you consider some black hole of a certain mass and a certain horizon area, and now we make a perturbation. So we, we maybe um, add some matter so that, the area, so that the mass of the black hole increases. Um, then there's a first law. Okay, that says that the change in mass is proportional to the change in this horizon area. So that's like the statement that the change in energy is proportional to the change in entropy of the system. Um, what's playing the role of temperature is this uh, quantity called surface gravity, which is related to how much curvature there is at the horizon. And then there's a second law. So in classical general relativity, um, there were results that the area of horizons should only increase with time if, if, you, if you consider general dynamics or throw things into the black hole. Um, this should be increasing. Okay. 
Um, and again, that sounds like a property that this, is, this sounds like a property of, of entropy in thermodynamic systems. Okay. And so Bekenstein suggested that this horizon area of black holes actually should be interpreted as an entropy of the black hole, uh, uh, an entropy uh, associated with some degrees of freedom of the black hole. Okay. But at the time, this was very mysterious because we're we're talking about a classical theory of gravity. Uh, it's not really clear what the microscopic degrees of freedom are or how you would count the number of states of a black hole. OK, but 30 or 40 years later, we now have examples of quantum theories of gravity where we talk about black holes. And we know that what he was saying is exactly realized in ADS-CFT. OK, so in ADS-CFT, I mentioned that the black holes, so say a spherical black hole in anti sitter space, this corresponds to a thermal state of a conformal field theory on a sphere. Okay, so think about a, a field theory on a sphere. This has a discrete spectrum of states. Actually, uh, in the previous lecture, uh, there was a discussion of the spectrum of operators in a CFT. And so many of you might know that the, the spectrum of energy eigenstates for a CFT on a sphere um, is actually the same. It maps over to the spectrum of uh, operators in a Euclidean, local operators in a Euclidean CFT. So there's this discrete spectrum of states. Um, and just like any other theory, we could consider the thermal ensemble. Pardon. I, I'm talking about you. So here, here we're you, Lorentzian. Okay. So this is CFT on. Right, so it's, it's, I'm talking about this example again. Okay. Okay, so it's a, it's a, a black hole in ADS, uh, Lorentzian CFT on a sphere times time in a thermal ensemble. And so what that means is I'm considering this ensemble of energy eigenstates with probabilities given by the usual Boltzmann weights. OK, so, so when I said before that the thermal state corresponds to the black hole, this is precisely what I mean by the thermal state. This particular mixed state of the quantum system, this ensemble, um, corresponds to the black hole. And now we can understand exactly what's going on. Why, why does this horizon area um, on the, on the gravity side have properties that are like entropy. Um, well, it's because in this fundamental description of the black hole through CFT uh, degrees of freedom, um, um, we actually have a microscopic theory. And it's true in that theory that the horizon area on the gravity side maps over to the thermodynamic entropy in the CFT side. Okay, so. So in ADS-CFT, um, the statement would be that, yes, this area on the gravity side, it does have a microscopic interpretation as counting some states. And it's precisely the usual formula for entropy. Um, so if you take those probabilities given by the Boltzmann factors, um, then this is the standard formula for entropy, and this uh, corresponds to the area of the black hole horizon. Okay, so so now if I if if I consider you know going to a larger black hole, um, then I'm 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 taking this ensemble and I'm changing the temperature, and I could tell you exactly how much the entropy changes, and just tell you how much the mass changes. Uh, and you can just verify all these things. Yes?
Right. Um, so, yeah, so we can consider more general kinds of, of black holes um, with charges and so forth. Um, and again, the idea would be that, um, so if, if, if I start from, if I start from this one and, and say add some charge or some spin, um, uh, th then we should still, this type of formula would still be understood to hold in the CFT. In the, sometimes in the limit of, uh, you know, in cer for certain very special black holes, uh, you have limits where the area goes to zero. And in this case, this is understood as um, that you're, you're taking a limit where the ensemble of states in the CFT um, is, is a sort of a small number of states um, so that the, the entropy also would, would go to zero. Um, I, I should say when, right, sometimes uh, it's important to distinguish, so these CFTs often have a parameter like the central charge or the N in a gauge theory. Um, often when we're talking about classical things on the gravity side, we are really talking about these being equal to the leading, uh, the leading contributions to the field theory quantities in an expansion in one over the large number. So, um, so sometimes there could be zero classical area, but then there could still be some small entropy, which is um, instead of going like n squared or like the central charge, it could go like some smaller power. Um, all right, I'm going to, so that's, that's how we understand this connection between black hole areas and entropies um, in this modern context of ADS-CFT. The entropy of the CFT in the thermal state maps over to the area of the black hole. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wait, so not talking about entanglement entropy yet. This is just thermal entropy. Yeah, this is ordinary entropy, yeah. But that's the next thing. Um, so I'm going to jump right to the most important, the most important formula or development um, in, in the recent, uh, in all this recent work. Um, so there's a generalization of this. So 35 years after this, uh, this work, um, in the context of ADS-CFT, it was understood that there's uh, an amazing and massive generalization of this connection where instead of just considering thermal states, we can consider any state of the CFT that would have some kind of arbitrary gravity dual. So it, it could be not just a black hole, but any kind of uh, any kind of space time, even even empty space. Okay, so we're going to generalize to the case where the CFT is in some much more general state. And we're going to generalize to the case where we're talking about the entropy not of the entire CFT, but of an arbitrary subsystem of the CFT. And then what these guys, Ryu and Takeyanagi, did was to say that that much more general kind of entropy, so the entropy of a sub, an arbitrary subsystem of an arbitrary state, they said that also has a geometrical interpretation.
um, as some kind of area in the, okay, so, so now this is an arbitrary state. We consider some arbitrary region, and here's the dual, okay, dual space time. Um, and this entropy has some interpretation as some kind of an area in the dual space time. Okay. But I have to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait a little bit. Um, I have to tell you more about what I mean by the entropy of a subsystem. Okay, um, so we need to understand that better. And, and then we'll understand exactly what the statement is. Okay. But this is, you can think of this as just, you know, one, one particular tiny example of this much more general statement, um, which has kind of opened the door uh, for a, a huge leap in our understanding of, of this uh, ADS CFT correspondence. Yeah. Well, it's. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a lot more about this, but so far just think of, there doesn't have to be a double, it's just a mixed state. We can talk about entanglements without actually purifying, but um, yeah. Okay, so I wanna review, what, what do I mean by subsystem entropy? Okay. So people, by the way, people talk a lot about entanglement entropy. Um, it's really just the entropy of a subsystem. Um, it's not, it's not, a diff it's the same notion of entropy, but just applied to subsystems of general quantum systems. Um, so that's what I wanna remind you of now. So the context of this is that I want to say, consider any quantum system with, with multiple parts. Okay, so I consider a quantum system where the Hilbert space factorizes into a tensor product so this would always be the case if I have individual, like different degrees of freedom. If I, if I can isolate some, some degrees of freedom which are a subset of the whole system, then according to general rules of quantum mechanics, the Hilbert space has this tensor product structure. Okay. And we're gonna consider um, a subsystem, I'll call it A, of a quantum mechanical system. And so we'd ask the question, um, if we have a state of the whole system, so say we have some general state of the entire quantum system, um, what is the state, how do we describe the state of just the subsystem? If we're only interested in, say, expectation values of operators that act on the subsystem, um, what, is, what is the description, what is the most efficient description of just the subsystem um, where I don't have to worry about the entire state. And, you know, in the classical world, we just say, well, okay, this is the configuration of, subs the, of the A part, this is the configuration of the B part. But in the quantum world, it's not possible, um, there's, no, there's no state psi A, which reproduces all the expectation values for that subsystem starting from some general state. So what you need to do is actually consider an ensemble. So, okay, so there's no, well, let me just write down this statement. So the state of the subsystem, A, is an ensemble of pure states. Um, so if I consider all of the operators O, A acting on that subsystem and I wanted to try to find a state psi A such that the expectation value of O in psi is equal to the expectation value of
this full operator in the full system, then I would not be able to, to find it in general. OK. But what I can always do is find some ensemble, some set of states of the subsystem, and some probabilities so that So that this is true. Okay, so I can always find uh, I can always find an ensemble of states where the calculation of the expectation value in the ensemble, according to these usual rules, would reproduce the calculation of that expectation value in the full state that I started with. Yes. I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'll just write it down explicitly. Uh, so the question is, how do, I, how do I write down this ensemble? And OK, so this is, this is the procedure. You start with a system. The state of the original system, you can write in terms of the basis elements of the tensor product Hilbert space. Okay. And then you calculate uh, what people call the reduced density matrix. Okay, so you, I'm going to write down now an operator um, on the subsystem A, which is. So it's people describe this mathematical operation as tracing over a bar or the partial trace over over uh, the subsystem com the complement of a. Okay, so I can I could take these coefficients. I could just write down this operator and. Then you can always diagonalize this operator. So it's Hermitian. I can always diagonalize it, so I can write it in this form. Okay. And then the ensemble that I'm talking about is actually Is actually just this one. Okay, so it's it's probably more familiar to, uh, to you to say, okay, the state of a subsystem is described by this reduced density matrix, which I get by this procedure of tracing out the rest of the system. Um, but I want to emphasize that when we talk about density matrices, um, we're really talking about it's equivalent to be talking about ensembles, um, just sets of pure states with. Um, with certain eigenvalues, with certain sorry, uh, certain classical probabilities for being in those states. Okay. Okay. So, so in particular, this this calculation that I did over here, where you where you calculate uh, the ensemble average of this operator, this is the same as just taking trace of rho a times O a. So this is the more familiar thing. Ta take the density matrix and evaluate the trace of the density matrix times the operator. Okay. 
OK, so given any quantum system, you choose a subsystem. And you can always either calculate the density matrix um, or find this ensemble of states which completely captures the state of the subsystem. Now, in very special cases, you might just find a single state with probability 1. So that would be if the subsystem is itself in a pure state. But in general, the set of these probabilities is not just the set 1. There are, there are multiple probabilities. Um, and this is the definition of what it means for something to be entangled. So when, when you have your subsystem and you find the ensemble of states that describes it, and it's not just a single state, if it's actually a number of states with probabilities less than 1, um, this is what we mean by saying that A is entangled with the rest of the system. So A and A bar are entangled. The fact that you have these probabilities uh, where it's not just one and zeros, in the thermodynamics context, we would say that that's saying that we have some classical uncertainty about what the state is. So there exists classical uncertainty about the state of A. And so then we're back to the situation that exactly the same situation that we have in the thermal ensemble. When we talk about the thermal ensemble, you have a set of energy eigenstates, and you have a set of probabilities for those eigenstates. And, um, and when we talk about the thermal state, you compute expectation values exactly by this procedure. Okay. In that case, we quantified the uncertainty, the classical uncertainty about the state by using entropy. So in this case also, when we realize that our subsystem is now not defined by a specific state, but actually by an ensemble of states with these probabilities, then again, it's useful to characterize, um, to quantify this uncertainty. Are we, are we very close to this case where you have a pure state describing the subsystem, or, or uh, is, do we have a large amount of uncertainty? Okay, so being entangled is not if you, could be, you could be very entangled or just a little bit entangled. Um, you could have uh, just a little bit of classical uncertainty about which state your subsystem in, is in or a lot. Uh, and we quantify that by entropy. So quantify And it's exactly the same formula as I wrote down before. Okay, so This is the formula for entropy. It works just as well for these general ensembles as it does for the thermal ensemble. Um, in the quantum context, we can write down an equivalent formula in terms of the density matrix that I guess was written by von Neumann. Okay, so sometimes you'll see this as, as a formula for entropy, um, but it's the same as this, and it's the same as the usual formula for entropy. Okay, so this is just the ensemble describing the subsystem. What is the entropy of that ensemble? Um, and it's called entanglement entropy. But it's not really any different than the other entropies that we talk about. It's the same, it's the same definition. Okay. And so it's, since it's really the same quantity that we're talking about, this, I think, motivates more um, this Ryu, Ryu and Takianagi formula that we're going to write down later, that you know, if, if the entropy of the whole CFT corresponds to some geometrical quantity, the area of the black hole horizon, um, and now we look at the entropy of just a part of the CFT. Well, maybe that should also correspond to some similar quantity.
Okay, so summary. If you start from the state of a whole system, you can define this density matrix or this ensemble. And then you can characterize how much classical uncertainty there is using this entanglement entropy. Okay. But there are actually a few other quantities that come up. Um, this is this is one very useful combination of the, of the set of probabilities that characterize the ensemble. Uh, but sometimes we're interested in more detailed information. Okay. So if we have a, if we have a thermal system um, and we calculate the entropy, I could find another system which is not thermal, which has exactly the same entropy. I could have a, a different distribution of probabilities. Um, or I could have the, the canonical versus the microcanonical ensemble, and I could find two ensembles with the same entropy, uh, but they could be different. So sometimes you want to look at, in more detail, um, how do you characterize, uh, what, are, what are these probabilities? Um, and so just the set of probabilities in this entanglement context is called the entanglement spectrum. And then the other thing you'll hear about are some other combinations of all of the eigenvalues. So this is the entanglement entropy, but uh, in the literature, often you hear about Renyi entropies. So one over L, this, this is a, a quantity that you can compute from trace of the density matrix to the nth power, or the alpha power. So if, if I have a density matrix, I can the trace is always one, but if I take some power of it and then, then I take the trace, well, this is some quantity which is given by the sum over the probabilities raised to that power. Um, and then this particular, if you take the log of that and divide by one minus alpha, um, this defines the Renyi entropy. The reason for all this is that if if you take alpha to one, then you get the entanglement entropy. So if you take a limit. Um, so in, some, in a lot of context, the main reason why people talk about these ones is that in a lot of contexts, it's easier to calculate these Renyi entropies. Um, and so if you can calculate these uh, and find some analytic formula as a function of alpha. Often you can calculate it for integer alpha, but if you can find a, an analytic formula, um, then you can take the limit where alpha goes to one, and this gives you a way to calculate entanglement entropies. Okay, so, okay, so we've talked about going from a, a big system and describing the state of a subsystem but you can also think about going the other way. So say you start from a density matrix. So given rho, um, we can ask, is there a, a state? Is there a larger system? And can I find a, a pure state of a larger system where the state of the subsystem is rho? Yes. Um, so if, yeah, I mean, it's, it's considered to be some more generalized measure of entanglement. Um, you see that if, 
all of the probabilities, if the probabilities are again 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, um, if, if there's just one p and it's 1, um, I guess you get 0. It's, it's more of a formal quantity, but it's, it's often described as a more general measure of entanglement. Um, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have some of the nice properties that entropy in general has, but um, so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it has a really nice direct interpretation. Um, it's, it's more used as a calculational tool, but uh, I guess you can, you can consider it, I mean, you can consider anything that you build from these probabilities as some measure of entanglement, because if it's not entangled, then it's just one, zero, zero, zero. So any other quantity that you compute from those probabilities, um, it's sort of some measure that will, uh, that will tell you are, you, are you entangled or are you not entangled? Okay, so given a density matrix rho, um, we can go the other way and find, try to find what are called purifications of rho. Okay, so generally, I can describe the most general purification. So, so say I start with a Hilbert space for a, a system. Um, so what I can do is take some other Hilbert space, consider this tensor product, and then starting with my ensemble, okay. by the way, I'm assuming these are orthogonal. So if I, if I take a, another Hilbert space whose dimension is at least as large, then I can write down the following state. So I choose some orthogonal states in the other Hilbert space. So again, these are orthogonal. Okay, so I need, I need the dimension of the other Hilbert space to be at least as large as, sorry, at least as large as the number of, of states appearing in my ensemble. Um, and then I could write down this state. Okay, so this is a state in the larger Hilbert space. And it turns out that any, kind, any purification can be described in this way. Okay, so anytime, any, anytime where you have a state in a, in a big Hilbert space and you find that the state of a subsystem is equal to this, um, then the whole state you can re you can write in this way. You can always find sort of orthogonal states in the in the two subsystems where I can write um, the full state as this this kind of um, the superposition of the product states. Okay, um, so you can check if you start with this one and then you calculate the density matrix using the procedure that I described. Remember, I had these coefficients c, and then we had the c and the c dagger. So the square root of p will appear twice, and then we'll end up with just getting uh, the pi and, and, the, and the states appearing. Um, so you can check that starting from this state, calculating the density matrix, and getting the ensemble, you get exactly this. Okay. So this is sort of the general way you can go from a density matrix to a, a pure state of a larger system. Um, this particular way of writing it is known as the Schmidt decomposition, and you can prove that it's always possible to do that. Yes. Yeah, so not not uh, um, actually generally generally not unique. So once I fix the larger space. I'm actually able to choose any orthogonal, say I have 12, uh, say I have 12 different states appearing in the ensemble, just choose any 12 uh, orthogonal, orthonormal states here, and it, it gives you a purification. So it's very non-unique, actually. Um, one of the interesting things that you realize, though, an interesting thing is, uh, is uh, if, you, if you were to consider the other part of the system. So instead of looking at A, look at, look at B. Um, and 
calculate the entanglement entropy or the spectrum of the density matrix for B, you're going to get the same answer. Okay, so this, this, is, this formula is completely symmetrical between A and B. Um, so if I, if I find a purification and then I say, what is the entanglement spectrum for the B subsystem? Or what is the entanglement entropy for the complement? Um, it's exactly the same. So it implies that row A and row B have the same spectrum. So row A and row B have the same entanglement spectrum, the same entanglement entropy, and so forth. Um, so that'll come up later. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, I, so I was going to talk about that specifically. Um, let me postpone the answer to that. But so, um, but just for just for two minutes, I'll postpone the answer to that question. Okay. So um, okay. So let me just do an example. Um, if you take the thermal state. Okay. So you have some some general thermodynamic system. Um, in the thermal state with temperature T, okay, well, we actually often think about a purification of that. Um, when, you, when you're learning about thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, uh, you, you say the thermal state is really the state where you have your system and you have it coupled weakly to a heat bath, okay. And, And then you say the whole system is in some pure state, uh, and, and we, we have, if you just consider the subsystem, then it's in this canonical ensemble or this thermal ensemble. Okay, so, so in that context, we think about the purification as being the pure state of uh, the system plus bath. And in that context, also, the thermal entropy of the subsystem is the entanglement entropy between the system and the bath. Okay, so the thermal Okay, so again, this entanglement entropy is something that you've considered all the time. Um, when you were thinking about thermodynamic systems as systems coupled weakly to a heat bath. Uh, okay, yeah, I should the hat or something. So yeah, the the well, oh, oh, so good. B could be much larger, but I've only chosen. I'm only summing over the non-zero probabilities. Yeah, so, so I guess I should say pi is not equal to zero. OK. Yeah. OK. OK, so there's a very special case of this purification that comes up a lot in these discussions. OK. So one. One nice choice that I can make, okay, which is rather different. Here we normally assume that the heat bath is a much larger system. Um, but if I want to, I can write down a purification where the other system is exactly the same system. Okay, so if I take B is equal to A, and I take the state of the combined system as Okay, so this is um, this is for a thermal state. Instead of considering a big heat bath, I'm going to write a purification where the where the 
other system is exactly the same, and I choose these states to be exactly the same as these states, OK, so then I've defined this state where I have the square roots of the Boltzmann factors. And and it's symmetrical between the two sides. OK, so this is called the thermofield. This is called the thermofield double. Okay, so this is an example where you start with a thermal state and choose a particular purification where the other one is this, the other, the B system is the same as the A system. Actually, when do I start? Do, do I have five minutes? Okay. Okay. Okay, so in the last five minutes, what I want to do is go back to ADS CFT now. Um, answer your question and motivate uh, um, what, I, what I'll do in the next lecture this afternoon. Okay, so back to ADS CFT. So I said earlier that the CFT in a thermal state on a sphere is equal to, is dual to the black hole. And that the entropy is equal to the horizon area. But I wasn't very precise. When we talk about black holes in general relativity, um, there's the part of the black hole outside the horizon. Okay, I'll draw these conformal diagram. So in ADS, um, that corresponds to this. So there's a part of black hole outside the horizon. But then you can sometimes, if you want, you can extend the geometry past the horizon. So you can do that and actually maximally extend it. Um, there's a canonical way to do that. And you find that there's this two-sided black hole that has a Schwarzschild geometry on the outside in both sides, and two different asymptotic regions. And EDS, this would be asymptotically ADS with some spherical boundary. This side is asymptotically ADS with some spherical boundary. Um, if I look at a time slice through that, it looks like this wormhole geometry with two asymptotically ADS regions. Okay. And So what, when we talk about the thermal state, what, what is it dual to? Is it dual to this, or is it dual to the whole thing? Um, it's not totally clear. But Maldacena wrote a paper in 2001 with a specific proposal that ties into what we were just talking about. Okay. So Maldacena said, that the maximally extended black hole, because it has these two asymptotic regions and therefore two different boundaries, which are spheres, he said that should correspond to something which is not just one CFT, but actually two different CFTs. And in this, in the case where we're talking about a thermal state of a CFT, okay, we just realized there's a canonical system and state where you start from a thermal state, you double it, you double the whole system, and then you write down this symmetrical state. Okay, so there's this very natural thing from the point of view of quantum mechanics where, the, where it's a symmetrical system with two copies of your original system, and each side looks the same. That sounds just like this extended black hole in the, from the geometrical prescription. Um, so Maldacena said, conjectured that this thing was dual to the thermofield double. Okay. 
And, okay, so this, I'll, I'm just drawing the spatial, this is the spatial slice, and he says this is dual to this specific state where you take two CFTs which are not interacting at all, just two completely separate systems, except you put them into this particular state, okay? Okay, and this hints at something really dramatic. What we've really done from the context, in the context of what I've been talking about the, the rest of the lecture is we've taken two different systems and we've just entangled them in this particular way. So I took two completely different CFTs, just two copies of the same thing, no interactions. The only connection at all that, that says that those are related in any way is that we've added, we've gone into this thermal field double state, which is a particular purification of the thermal state on one side. Okay, so it's entangled between the one side and the other side in the symmetrical way. And apparently doing this entangling On the gravity side, according to Molesina, what it's done is it's taken your two empty ADS spacetimes that you might have thought you had if you had to say the vacuum state of those two CFTs, and it's provided some kind of connection geometrically between those, this wormhole going from one side to the other. Okay. Um, and so this is, I think, the first suggestion that and this was before Ryu and Takenagi and everything, this is a suggestion that somehow entanglement, just by adding this entanglement, you've connected the two sides up. And the next lecture, I want to I argue um, that even in the context where you just have one CFT, we'll see that entanglement between different parts of that CFT um, is kind of intimately related. You might say it's the reason why you have uh, some connected space time that's uh, emerging as the gravity duel. Okay, but we'll get to all of the details in the next lecture.